I have this to say to Najib and Rosma. If truly you are not involved, you did not order the killing of Azan Tuya, let this case see the light of day. Let there be a trial. If you want justice, that's the only way. Don't run away from a trial. I can assure you that Najib cannot survive in jail. He just can't. He's not built for such things. Rosma would never discuss Alton Tuya. Did you ever try to discuss it with her? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I wouldn't dare. So you just knew that? We all knew. Her children knew. Her daughter knew. Her sons knew. Everyone knows. It was an open secret. Everyone knew that Altan Tuya was murdered on instructions. Okay. Discussed this with uh, the people around them, and I discussed this with her brother, uh, Najib's brother. And even they are perplexed that why did Altan Tuya have to be murdered? It didn't make sense. If she wanted money, there was abundant money, billions. She only wanted half a million ringgit, not even dollars. The issue at hand was not about money. The issue at hand was that Alvan Tuya was pregnant. Was she actually pregnant with Najib's child? Rosma could never accept this. That's why she was bombed. She was c -fought. What do you know about their involvement in the Alton Tuya murder? Because I know that's something that you have you have been involved. Um, well, to speak honestly, Najib is definitely involved in the murder. You need to rationalize with these two facts. Firstly, there is no way a serving police officer would assassinate and then bomb, use a C4 dynamite and bomb a lady who's pregnant. And secondly, he scrambled when the first statutory declaration was issued and sent both his brothers and his personal lawyer in the date of night to meet the person who had issued and signed the first SD to reverse and revise the SD so that it doesn't show his involvement in the case. There is no reason for him to do that if he was not involved in the murder. He didn't have to change the second SD at all. Very panicky. Rosma actually just sat at the corner and she said, you talk to my husband, let him make the calls. Because she knows there are certain things that really would make Najib angry and this this situation was one of them. You must remember that this whole Al Tantuya fiasco was caused by Rosma. Rosma went on a rampage that night. She wanted to kill Al Tantuya. She wanted to get rid of the child that was in Al Tantuya's stomach. How do you know that? Well, I've been told this by Pierre Bala. Pierre Bala was watching, at the end, he was watching over Altantuya for close to two weeks before she was murdered. He was hired by Raza Paginda to watch over her. But did um, you ever know any of that from Rosma herself? Did no, she speak to you or did you witness anything this, no, at the house? We never, never discussed, discussed this. This was never discussed in the house. Everyone. You must remember, it's the house of the Deputy Prime Minister. You've got the ADCs, both her ADC, his ADC. You've got bodyguards. You've got uh, their maids. You've got their house people, their house workers. There are more than 25 people stationed in the house full time. Everyone know what happened that night, but no one would speak to it. It's true, she was at the scene of the crime. She was waiting downstairs. She wanted to make sure the lady was properly blown up. She didn't want evidence. How do you know that? I was told this by Bala. Bala was the, the last person to see Altan Tuya alive. They literally took Altan Tuya off his hand into their car. 
That's right. Yeah. But he he wasn't there he on wasn't the there, night. But the, there's so many people. You know, the 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 most pitiful thing about this whole case is, I've told this to the government. That night, the night after, there are twenty, thirty people staying in Najib's house, working for him. Servicemen working in the house. You need to interrogate them. They will tell you the truth. They were there on the night, on the night after, on the night before, where this entire thing blew up. She was supposed to be killed the night before. Actually, they missed the boat. They couldn't get her. They got her the next night. This whole thing was planned, and knowing Rosma, she had gone into a tirade. There have been major uh, screaming in the house. She been hysterical, and that's how this whole thing would have uh, snowballed into a murder. These are realities. These are facts. I dare tell you now because these are facts. So she was there. So so tell me, where, what was her involvement on the night of the murder? She. She instructed the officers to kill her, but they would never take her instruction. She then told her husband, under no uh, uncertain terms, that she wanted Alfan to be dead. And that's what happened. And she went with them on the night. She was there that night. She she was at a function. She went to the site after her function. It's true she was at a function. She claimed she was at a function. It's true, but after the function, she went to the site. She wanted to ensure it was done. Mind you, Malaysians don't kill people, not even government service officers. They don't go around killing. It's not. It's not the norm. And so she went to the site to make sure that she'd been blown up, or yes, they have to ensure the job was done. And and what did they want you to say? They wanted me to say that Najib was not guilty. But the manner in which they wrote the second statement of defence was not really denying Najib's involvement, but saying that coming up with flimsy excuses like it's out of time, it's time barred, and it's rest judicata because the case was also previously filed. They never ever said they were not guilty. They have never stood up in any of their court papers. If you look at all their uh, affidavits, none of the defendants have written down there. It's not true. They cannot deny the truth. They can only skirt around it. Well, they can't continue skirting around it anymore because they have lost their dominance. Now they have to face up to the truth. I have been literally held at ransom by Najib and his emissaries, not to testify against him, not to give testimony, not to give, not to sign affidavits against him in court. And I've been held uh, in this manner for the last seven years. I didn't have a choice. Every time I terminated their lawyer, they would bring up a matter and say, "We're taking action against you. The income tax department is winding you up right now. The bank is calling on a loan, which was settled through a settlement agreement in 2013. In 2017, two days after." Najib's uh, political secretary, chief political secretary, was appointed the chairman of the bank. The bank sued me for monies which we have already settled through a settlement agreement in 2013, and this is four years later. So my hands are tied. I cannot speak, but that didn't stop me. That night. So what happened? I mean, well, she called me in the late afternoon. And she asked me whether I could locate this person. I've never met him in my life, Pia Bala. I contacted a few friends because uh, Pia Bala was a former. He was an ex-police officer, and there were people who knew him. And we managed to locate him. I went to see him, but he was very insistent that if he was to change anything, he wants a clarification from Najib and Rosma of the actual involvement. So I went back to their official residence in Sri Satya. It was setting somewhere between seven or eight p.m. And I sat down with Abdul Najib in the lounge with Abdul, and explained.
to him that this gentleman, Bihai Bala, is insisting that he is speaking the truth and that his statutory declaration, he is an ex-police officer, he would not lie in a statutory declaration. And that's only one way that he was to be convinced to change it, and that was to meet Datu Sri and Datu Sri. At that time, he was the Deputy Prime Minister. And they had to explain to him why they were not involved. Najib said, I will send my brother. He called his brother in front of me. Datu Johari Razak, who's a senior managing partner in one of the largest law firms in Malaysia called Shun Delmo and told him that he is to meet this gentleman, Bihai Bala. But Johari was not in town. Johari then arranged his key man, a senior counsel himself. Uh, he's now uh, Tansri, Tansri, Tansri Cecil Ibrahim to, to start working on a statutory declaration that would absorb Najib. He then called his brother, another brother called Tatu Nazim Raza, who is an architect, and asked Nazim to meet urgently with Bihai Bala. So I called Bihai Bala. I said, okay, Najib cannot meet you, but his brother is going to meet you. And you can, can you come to a, a particular venue which was in Mutiara Damansara, near the IKEA, the, the flagship IKEA mall in Malaysia, to meet Najib's brother. So he came, we met maybe 9, 10 o'clock at night. Najib even brought his wife along. She was pregnant. But she didn't want to let him go at night to handle such a nasty task. So I left Dr. Najib to talk to Piaibala. I went to the other corner because Nazim wanted to have a private discussion with him. And after the discussion, uh, Yevala said, okay, he's willing to change the testimony. And uh, Nazim then organized for him to be sent to a hotel in KL. So you don't know what, what convinced um, Bala to change well, his... What Bala told me after that mm. was that he was threatened by Dr. Nazim that Dr. Nazim informed him that Dr. Najib has arranged his personal security and some government enforcement officers outside his house, Piaibala's house. And his wife had called Piaibala to inform him that there were two cars uh, with many people sitting down inside, many men sitting down inside, in, inside outside their house at the date of night. And uh, he had no choice. Basically, here you have the Deputy Prime Minister. He was against... Uh, the greatest of uh, people, he, he basically didn't have a choice, he had to succumb. They met in the hotel, Dr. Nazim uh, arranged for the lawyer, Cecil Abraham, Sunil Abraham, and the Commissioner of Oaths. They met uh, Pia Bala in the hotel, they booked a room, they constructed a new SD. I, 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 I didn't see the SD till the next day, but I know that uh, it was done as per the instruction of uh, Dr. Nazim. And this SD was then presented to the press the next morning. Here comes the call from Najib's emissary, Dr. Aziz Rahim. He says, you go get yourself a medical certificate. You cannot give testimony are you willing to give testimony to say that everything that was said earlier was a lie? I said, I cannot because I would be held in contempt of court. I would be lying to court. For your information, even Najib as the Prime Minister has not denied the acquisition. He's merely skirting around it. He's, he's going around in circles, but he's never said it's not true. And he hasn't lied in court? No, he hasn't. I cannot lie to the court and I will not. If you insist on me getting a medical certificate, tell me where to go, I'll go and collect it. So I went to a government hospital. It was already ready for me. I collected it, I gave it to the lawyer. Well, this judge was very persistent. 
Although Tan Sri Shafi asked for a date, a month or two, she gave two weeks. She said, I want the witness to give testimony in two weeks. Two weeks came. Again, this time uh, I was called to Tan Sri Shafi's office. Dato Aziz Rahim was there. He was uh, in the room. He said, I tell you what, my friend is a doctor in Pantai Hospital. Okay? He's going to get you admitted. And you must get admitted two, three days prior, not the night before. Two, three days prior, he's going to say that you're very sick. He's going to say that you need to be admitted and you cannot attend the cross examination coming in, the coming Friday. Of course, I didn't have a choice. My hands are tied. I made it loud and clear in the most silent of terms to whoever was involved in the case that I didn't have a choice. I got admitted. I was taken to the emergency. In half an hour, I was in the ward. They came up with a medical report. The Tansri Shafi didn't like the medical report. He edited it. He instructed the doctor to change it. And that medical report was served to the court. But this uh, lady judge, her ladyship, I really, my salutations to her, she was not buying any of this. Okay, he's back here in 10 days. 10 days is a very short time. Of course, they fought for a longer period, but she said, no, I want to get this wrapped up. I want this cross-examination. 10 days came, just prior to that, Tato Aziz calls me, he said, come to my office. Lo and behold, I'm there, Shafi is there. You go overseas for treatment. You cannot be in Malaysia now. I said, it looks like what happened to Pia Bala is happening to me now. Exactly the same situation. I said, how long am I going to go overseas? No, 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 no. Go now. One day after the court case, you come back. I had to go. I didn't have a choice. Here you have the Prime Minister's emissary instructing me to take his instruction or be destroyed. I'm a businessman. I've got liabilities. I've got assets. I cannot afford this. I did what they wanted. I went overseas. The judge came up with the judgment. She said, no, even though he's not here, because you all have prevented him from giving testimony, I'm granting the cross-examination that this uh, cross-examination, the decision on this cross-examination will be given. All right? Then came the elections. And things have changed. And so Complete. the court case is going... The hunter has become the hunted. The hunter has become the hunted. The whole thing has changed now. Now, the first thing I did was I went to a new lawyer, a very prominent gentleman, Dr. Al Kinadan, he is a former judge. I explained to him the entire situation. He told me to quickly write to the court, tell the court that whatever was asked, was to be asked during the cross examination, we affirm it. We affirm that Shafi was actually not appointed by me, but by Najib. I, was, I have never paid Shafi a single cent. All payments to Shafi came from Dr. Najib. Second, that the statement of defense that I filed first, which was served on the plaintiff's lawyer, was the only true statement of defense. And who wrote the second one? Shafi. And Shafi is now um, defending Najib? Najib, yes. And Shafi himself has been charged? He himself has been charged. Um, so, what do you make of that? The fact that Shafi is now defending Najib? It's meant to happen. Birds of the same feather flock together. It's meant to be. He knows all of Najib's dark secrets. Why do you think um, no action has been taken against Shafi so far? I believe that uh, there are actions being filed. I was uh, informed that uh, the plaintiffs uh, were trying to serve on him uh, legal documents with regards to contempt proceedings, but he's been awaiting taking service. 
but he has recently, as early as this evening, taken service of this uh, court documents. So they they are initiating uh, contempt proceedings Going against back him. to Rosmar, um, just uh, tell us. I mean, what motivates her? I mean, this is, tell us a little bit about her love of jewelry. Her, I mean, it, it's it's excessive though. It's not. You know, um, just explain to us what drives her. What you know, she's just plain greedy, and because she came, she didn't come from a very privileged background, unlike Najib. Suddenly, she sees all these blinks which she never imagined she could own, and she wants it all. She wants to be the largest collector of pink diamonds in the world. She's told me this. Find all the pink diamonds that you can find. She wants it all. She's just too greedy. But she could never wear them. I mean, exactly. isn't that the... Exactly. You see, the, the diamonds, uh, especially the expensive uh, priceless pieces, they were her way of keeping the money. She buys a diamond for six million ringgit. It is better than keeping six million in a bank account. It was an easy way for her to siphon off uh, the corruption money and to keep them in a very simple place. She did never imagine they would lose the election. They never imagined the police would raid their house. Would they be foolish enough to leave 12,000 sets of jewellery worth a billion ringgit in their house? Impossible. They never imagined this would happen. It was through divine intervention. Not even the Pakatan Harapan uh, government knew for sure they would win. It happened. It just happened. It was no longer about a brick and mortar business. It was more about how to steal money, how to rob money from 1MDB, from the banks that loaned 1MDB. you got to ask yourself a very good question though. There were lawyers involved, both in Malaysia, overseas. There were professional bankers involved, both in Malaysia, overseas. You've got Goldman Sachs uh, who facilitated this whole thing. Right? They have good lawyers. They knew what was going on. They knew it's a scam. If they say they didn't know, it's a lie. But everyone facilitated this great robbery. Today, we are focusing on Najib and Jolo and Rosma. But behind them, you have this huge section of professionals who are also involved. And that's the same in Malaysia with these court cases yes, too, I suppose. Yes, yes, exactly. Same yeah. in Malaysia. You have got people in authority at the bank level, at the monitoring level, at the enforcement level. Everybody kept quiet. They didn't dare. You had our former Deputy Prime Minister, Tan Sri Mahidin. He voiced out and he got sacked. What could he do? What could anyone do? You've got the second man, just for making one statement, he was sacked. And what was she doing with that money? Well, she's got Lord Chilluri. And she's got a watch in uh, Dubai with much more jewellery than what's here. She's got a, sorry? A she's got a vault, a bank vault in uh, Dubai with lots more money than what's in Malaysia. Is She's that? a very rich lady. You know, Najib and Rosma stole at least a hundred billion ringgit from Malaysia. At least. How do you how do you know that? I've configured all the dealings that they did. I know that some of the contracts that they have uh, awarded, uh, the percentage that they asked for these contracts, you take all the figures together, you add one MDB, you've got one hundred plus billion. I vowed to give Alfa Duya her justice. I will do whatever it takes so that she gets her justice. That the people who ordered her killing must face justice. All this while, the last 10 years, Najib has been avoiding to go for trial. Osma has been avoiding to go for trial, using their sheer dominance with the, as the Prime Minister always managing to strike out the case against them with regards to Altan Tuya, with regards to P.I. Bala. And I believe that there is a chance, there is a slim chance that this matter will go to trial now. Next Monday, the case management for this case will begin. So this is Bala's wife's case yes. against you and Najib yes, and Rosmar? Yes, eight defendants.
Well, they have managed to get themselves struck off from the case at the High Court. But the case is now pending in the Federal Court. There is also another case where Al Tantuya's uh, father has filed against Najib and that case will go for trial in January. I have this to say to Najib and Rosma, if truly you are not involved, you did not order the killing of Al Tantuya, let this case see the light of day. Let there be a trial. If you want justice, that's the only way. Don't run away from a trial.